I said, come on. Hearing young people preach and speak from the Word of God does something within me. It excites me that this next generation, the millennial generation, the generation alpha, there is hope for them in Christ Jesus. They will we'll be passing a bat on to them. Amen. So take every opportunity to encourage young people. I'm encouraged today because my grandson is in the house. Woo! He loves stories. He loves um, $100 bills. Um, if, if you want to bless him after the service. He's, he's Aussie through and through, but I'm trying to instill some Scottish virtues <laughs> within him. Hey, Flynn, give us a wave. Hiya. So sweet. Okay. I'm going to speak to you today on this message. So that was a long passage uh, of Scripture. Uh, I'm hoping the exegesis is going to be a bit shorter <laughs> than that. We've been talking about uh, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. This church had started well. How often do we read that in the Scripture? They started well. They were strong in the faith. Uh, in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, uh, he speaks to them against asceticism which is, if you like, uh, it's an athletic term where we train our bodies in order to achieve a goal. In a spiritual term, it is extreme self-denial um, in order to attain some spiritual goal. But this was an extreme measure, which was not in the will of God. There's some extreme measures in history. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a guy in India uh, who spent most of his life on top of a tall pillar People would bring him up food and water and stuff. He was there for decades. There are other people who put their hands up to heaven uh, for years without putting it down. A stream form of asceticism. It's very strange. And Paul spoke against this quite firmly. Um, now, that's not to say we're not to pick up our cross daily, deny ourselves, uh, and seek the Lord. Um, but it, it was tantamount to being under the law. And so Paul had to speak against it. And so here we come to this chapter, chapter 3, to the church in Colossae. Uh, and Paul lays out this uh, narrow path. Um, if you are here last week, you heard a good uh, message uh, that Paul Kamek brought, um, and he did touch on this briefly, about being on the narrow path. You remember the picture on the screen of Jesus walking on this very narrow path? Um, I'm going to focus on that a bit more today and unpack it. So there is a narrow path. On one side is law, religion, good works. On the other side, there is hyper-grace or a cheapened form of God's grace. Matthew 7, uh, 13 to 14 says this. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many I don't know how that makes your heart feel. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Satan does not want you on the narrow path. He will do everything he can with his uh, cunning, his deception, his lies to get you off the narrow path. If he can't get you on the narrow path, he will try and push you to excess in your religious zeal, either into religion, law, and works, or into hyper-grace. If you go off into the law, then there's a danger of losing your assurance of salvation. And he encourages you all the more to do good works in order to earn salvation. And so off you go from the narrow path onto the shoulder, a bump. Um, and you start to do good works. You fear for your salvation. And so guess what? You do more good works to atone for that sin. And then you sin again. And you do more good works to atone for that sin. And you get further and further off the narrow path. You look across the street to those in the hyper-grace movement. And they're not doing very many good works. Some are not inclined to do any good works at all. Lest they put themselves under the law. You become 
restless. You lose the joy of the Lord. You lose your peace in Christ. You study the word not to know God more, but to have some favor from God. Never being satisfied. On the other side of the street, things are a bit different. You have accepted Jesus has paid for your sins. Hallelujah. He died on the cross. Your sins, past, present, and future, have been atoned for. It is a completed work. Amen? That's the truth. That's a narrow path. But now as you take a step this way, something happens. As you go through the cross of Christ in repentance and become a believer, you now think there is no further need of repentance. That doesn't mean to say that these people on this side do not sin. They still sin. But when they do, they simply thank God and they carry right along. They scoff and mock those on the other side who seem weighed down by their guilt. They delight in quoting scriptures to them, like Galatians 5. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Amen, brother. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Be like us. They tend to focus on the New Testament. Speak only about the new covenant. The Old Testament to them is simply a history book. When those across the street cry out from it, the response is, that's the old covenant. When they confront you regarding your sin and say to you, Hold on a moment. 1 John 1 9 says, If you confess your sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us your sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Or they might quote the Lord's prayer to you Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But the people on this side ain't listening. They say, Nope, even that is old covenant. But Jesus said it, you reply. Yeah, before he went to the cross. So it's old covenant. It's a deception of the enemy to get you off the narrow path. Neither party are truly living the life that Christ has bought for them. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians uh, shows the Christian the sweet spot that we should aim for. To avoid both shoulders of this narrow path. Anyone ever swung a golf club in their life? Four people play golf. That's wonderful news. <laughs> I'm actually encouraged by that. <laughs> you swung a club, missed the ball. <laughs> when you're playing golf, where's my, where's my, where's your husband? He's playing golf. Huh? <laughs> we pray for him. We pray for him. Lord, bless Keith and, and heal him, we pray. When you're playing golf, and you go to swing and hit the golf ball, um, if it slices off here to the right, um, or if it hooks off to the left, then you've not got the sweet spot on the head of your golf club. If it one side or the other of the sweet spot, that's about all I know about golf. I also know it's very expensive and not for Scotsmen. But Paul is telling us here about the sweet spot that we should aim for in our Christian life that will keep you on the narrow path. So this letter, is a letter to help us drive straight down the middle. Remember that old Bing Crosby song? Straight down the middle, it went straight down the middle. No? It was only 1957, it wasn't that long ago. Okay, I think we should have the other slide up. <laughs> we should move on. Uh, anyone? know where this is taken? Not far from here. Mapleton, yeah. Mapleton Falls, and one uh, misty morning a couple of weeks ago, um, out of my archives of uh, photography. Paul starts chapter 3 with this premise. If, how many times in the Bible do we see the word if? If then you have been raised with Christ. He doesn't see, say, if you read your Bible. He doesn't say, if you go to church. He doesn't say, if you quote scriptures. We know that even Satan does that. No, rather, if you have repented of your sin, confess Christ as your Savior, 
if you have been baptized, if you have died to self. Just as Christ died on the cross and was raised to life, that beautiful picture of baptism. And then he rose, of course, to eternal life. But if that is you, then you ought to seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now the death that Christ died was a sacrifice once and for all. He brought an end to all sacrifices. There is no longer any requirement for blood to be shed. The blood of Christ atoned for all sin. However, that does not then give us a license to continue sinning. We are no longer slaves under the law, but we are slaves to righteousness. The King James says it this way. Who likes the King James? You like Bing Crosby and you like King James. Set your affection on things above. I, I like that. It's one thing to set your mind, but it's another to set your affection. Set your affection on things above. We're not under the law, but we are in a relationship with Christ. We are to no longer sin out of a fear of retribution of what God might do to us, but rather because we love him. Why would we pain the one that we love? Our eternal destination is Christ. We must set our affections above him and on our heavenly home. This world is passing. And we must not cling to it. Matthew Henry says this. It's a little bit highbrow. So we'll focus in for a moment. It's worth it. Heaven and earth are contrary to one another. And a regard to both is inconsistent. The prevalence of our affection to one will proportionally weaken our affection to the other. A servant cannot serve two masters. Elijah, remember, uh, on, on uh, Mount Carmel says, Choose this day whom you will serve. We are to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. We had a great time two weeks back. Uh, went out uh, west with the youth, uh, had youth camp. Eli did a fab job uh, of arranging that camp. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful, except uh, on the second day, I had a phone call from my wife. She says, I've got some bad news. I've just tried to reinsure our house uh, and find that our house is now uninsurable. We've managed to find someone who, who will insure it for $23,000 for one year's insurance. We kindly declined that offer. As we dug a little deeper, we discovered that part of this agenda of climate alarmism from the government, really it's not our government, as you know, it's a global elitist movement, is to try and get people out of their homes. And so they set the council on to redo the flood maps um, of all the areas which have flooded historically and set the boundaries much further away. They'll do the same, I think, with bushfire areas. So our house now in a flood zone, um, and we can't insure it. Probably not able to sell it. Nobody will want a house which is uninsurable. No one with a mortgage will be able to get that house. Our house may be worthless. Am I troubled? No, not really. Because <laughs> I chose some time ago to set my mind on things above. This world is passing. It's passing. Let's not be too concerned with it. Verse 3 states, For you have died. If you're dead, you ain't worried about a house. <laughs> ain't worried about your job. Ain't worried about money if you're dead. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ 
in God. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, come, follow me. He didn't say come to church. I can't remember reading the scriptures. <laughs> Jesus, Do you want to come to church? I invite you to church. He says, come, follow me. It was not a call to change a few things in our life. It wasn't a call to tweak our lifestyle choices or to give more money to charity or to do some good works or to read the Bible religiously. No, it wasn't. But it was far, far more than that. Jesus chose us. And in doing so, he called us. We are called his disciples. When he called his first 12 disciples, he called them to leave their fishing nets, to leave the tax office, to leave the doctor's surgery, to leave their homes, to leave their loved ones, indeed to die to those things. Likewise, today, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, there is a call upon your life. Now, I'm speaking to everyone in this room. Regardless of your history, regardless of your skill set, regardless of your age, is a call to die to the passions of this world and to serve the risen Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so now for the Christian, our life is hidden with Christ. He is now our protector. He is now our provider. Next slide, please, if you could. Um, there's a well-known old hymn, Rock of Ages, uh, which starts, Rock of Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. You know one? Give us a song. You're on. <laughs> I wish I could join in, I'm terrible at singing. <laughs> Amen. Do you want that one later? All right, we're just going to do one on the worship team. Where are you, Sonia? No. <laughs> we, will, we will do a good one. I promise you that. This was taken. Anyone know where this was taken? Another one from my photo album. Yeah, Petra. Yeah, yeah. There's this, there's this crack, this cleft, fissure in the rock. And you walk, actually, for, I don't know, a couple of kilometers. It gets narrower and narrower, this fissure. Um, and then you, suddenly you get this glorious sight of the Kazni, the treasury of the rose, uh, r rose red city of Petra. Uh, in Jordan. Went there a few years ago. Um, there's a cleft there for you in God. There's a cleft there for me in God. The hymn was written by a guy called Reverend um, Augustus Top Lady in 1762. Anyone remember? No? Not that old. Okay, we'll stick with Bing Crosby. 1762 is this stormy incident in England and he's caught in this terrible storm and he finds a fissure in a rock, a cleft in the rock. He shelters there and pens this beautiful hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Christ calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Why should we think he's not able to calm a storm in our life today? Matthew 7, 9 to 11 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus is our protector. He is our provider. We should not trust in our own understanding. Trust only in the one who makes our paths straight. Aren't you glad? You're hid with Christ. There's a storm coming. I think most of us know that. But there is also a cleft which is waiting for you in the rock of ages. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Paul gives us this wonderful promise in verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, 
then you also will appear with him in glory. If we make Jesus our life, then we have this assurance that we shall appear with him in glory. God in his goodness created the earth. He made man from the dust. Uh, he breathed his breath in man. And he calls that man, you and me, to follow him all the days of our life. Place the Holy Spirit within us as a guarantee of our redemption. His work in us is to perfect us and make us like Jesus. We were in the prayer room earlier and um, I just remembered something that I'd heard some time ago. Um, anyone uh, seen the statue of David? Yep, very, very fortunate, beautiful statue by Michelangelo. It was said that Michelangelo was asked the question, you know, how on earth did he take this uh, slab of marble and create something quite so uh, perfect and beautiful as the statue of David? He said, that was easy. I saw David in the marble and I just knocked off everything that wasn't David. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. He sees Christ in us and he knocks off everything which isn't Jesus. We need to ever yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. In a world which is struggling with identity and purpose, we, beloved, have the blessed assurance in his revealed word that I know whom I believe and I am persuaded. Come on that he is able to guard that until the day that has been entrusted. Oh, I've got another old picture. Pop that one up. There we go. This was taken on our holidays a few weeks ago in Englandshire. Um, in Yorkshire, I think, at an old church. This, this is a good thing about invasion, by the way. This, this is the Normans when they invaded England. They brought this. They brought these beautiful square towers. Not all bad things happen in invasion. There's some good things. It's our perspective, isn't it? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I, I don't know why Jesus didn't give me a voice to sing. I'd love to be able to do that. I'd love to be able to do that. John 14, 19 says, Because I live, you also will live. What a promise from God. Our lives are hidden with Christ. Paul in his letter to the Colossians goes on to encourage the saints. Tells them how they ought to live their lives. He says this. Okay, strap in. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Why is covetousness idolatrous? Because we give it worth, and we place that worth above the Lord Almighty. Don't covet your neighbor's Tesla. It'll only catch fire. Amen. Paul, Paul goes on and says, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Oh my goodness. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. The bowl of God's wrath is filling up. And we see that clearly in the earth as we look around. What's happening in Israel? What's happened in this nation? What's happening around the world? What's happening in some churches who have embraced all manner of immoral things. The wrath of God is coming. He goes on to say, in these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Next slide, thanks, Jess. Paul says you have been rescued from sin. 
You've been rescued from the consequences of sin, which is hell. You've been restored, are being restored, renewed day by day. So now make sure there is no residue, no trace of these things within you. Allow the Holy Spirit to perfect you. Allow him to knock off everything which is not Christ. Paul uses this phrase, uh, put off the old self, put on the new. A bit like changing clothes. Christ's work on the cross is not just one of forgiveness. It's also a work of righteousness. He gives us his righteousness in exchange for our filthy rags. He dresses us in a robe of righteousness. We should never take that off. Don't allow the enemy to come and tempt you with his lying lips, with his promise of pleasure, with no consequence. There's always a consequence in sin. Now we can choose uh, to consume our time and our affections on this world. But if we do, we will always be engaging with the struggle with sin. I remember when I was an early Christian just battling uh, sin and temptation in this continuous struggle. Every day I'm, I'm getting up and put my armor on. I'm just doing battle in the heavenlies and so on. And then I sin. Oh, what happened there? I was caught unaware. And so I'm struggling and battling. I'm struggling and battling. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. I think some of you probably do. Uh, but when I decided to place my affection on things above, when my focus became looking into the face of Christ, a lot of those struggles left me. If we give no time to the enemy to tempt us because we're worshiping the Lord, then guess what happens to our sin life? Paul bundles together anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. But he makes a point of highlighting this one. Do not lie to one another. Satan is the father of lies. So we should be very particular not to engage in lying. The world differentiates and says, oh, just a white lie. That was all right. That was a white lie. I don't know why they say that. It's a lie, is a lie, is a lie. It's of the enemy. It's of the kingdom of darkness. Paul says in Corinthians, what has fellowship, uh, what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what has Christ with Belial? A lie is a doorway to many diverse sins. So we need to avoid it. Okay, here we go, Paul. Give us some good news. How then should we live our lives? Put on then, Paul says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If we are to be a follower of Christ, then we must follow his example. Yep. Whilst we are still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still far off in rebellion and at enmity with God, he died for us. We have offended the one who is perfect, but he has chosen to forgive us that very great debt. So we likewise must forgive others who sin against us. Indeed, it is a command to do so. It is non-negotiable. Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 23 to 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Then it's acceptable. Our gifts to God are only acceptable when we walk in forgiveness. And so, we ought to be compassionate, kind, humble, meek, patient, long-suffering, and forgiving. But then Paul emphasizes, but above all these, put on love. Above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
Next slide, thanks, Jess. Put on love. Put on love. Why? Well, because Peter tells us in his uh, first letter, chapter 4, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. A Christian is not just someone who does not do evil. A Christian is someone who does not do evil and who does good. Above all, or as some translate, over all, over all, put on love. It is to be the priest's outer garment. We're called to be priests and kings. Is that true? Yep. So as priests, uh, we put on love as our outer garment. It's the one that everyone is going to see. Our inner garment, piety, generosity, humility, are not seen by others. They're undergarments. Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees who love to go into the marketplace and with a loud voice and with their phylacteries and dingly dangly pomegranates on their robes, pray loudly for a long time. She says, don't be like them. Rather, go into a closet and pray to your Father in heaven who is unseen. When you give, don't be like the Pharisees who make a great show of going into the temple waving their hundred dollar notes putting it into the basket rather be like the old widow who shuffled up in the shadows to give all that she had but love is our outer garment it should be on display for all to see and so we should be people of peace people of joy people of thanksgiving people of love and we should recognize one another by those traits in verse 16, Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Many read the Bible, but how many allow the word to dwell within them? It's an abode. It comes to live within you. It dwells there. We need to cultivate the soil of our hearts so that when we read God's word, it takes root within us. And we do that by thinking on things which are above, not on things which are below. Putting to death the sins and the desires of the flesh. Putting on the virtues and the character of God. Wearing the garment of love. Making every effort to live at peace with one another. Then we will find a fresh delight in his word. Greater insights will fall from heaven for us. And we will come to a greater height of adoration and worship of the king. The great revivalist uh, preacher D.L. Moody said with his last breath, Earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me. I must go. Oh, that that would be our prayer and our outworking now in life. Earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. We are citizens of heaven, called here to serve him on earth for a while. If you are a believer, earth is not your home. We're passing through. And so in closing, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you have truly died to yourself, then your life is hidden with Christ in God. Put yourself in the safe hands of the Savior. Here is your provider. He is your protector. We're not created to do life without God. God knows what we need, and what we need is God. Rest in the Lord. He is our peace, our joy, our hope. He is our home. Do you know Jesus? If you're a believer here, do you set your mind on things above, or have the worries of this world come to choke that to take your eyes off of him. Come on, church. Let's do some business with God today.
Have you eased off the narrow way just a bit? It's easy to do. It's a hard way, and few find it. Have you eased off a little bit into religion? Have you eased off a little bit into good works? Do you have an assurance of salvation? Perhaps you've taken the Lord a little too much for granted. Eased into, as some have done, a cheapened form of God's grace. The people of Colossae were once strong in the faith. Are you stronger now than you've ever been? Are you stronger now than you've ever been? Or do you need to ask the Lord today to help you, to refocus, to set your eyes on him, to set your mind on things above, to set your affections upon him once again, to get you back on course, hitting the sweet spot, driving down the middle, staying on the narrow path. Let's just close our eyes and wait upon the Lord for a few moments. ask you to stand with me let's do some business with God today eh? we're going to sing blessed assurance I'm going to pray Lord uh, for those in this room who are uncertain of their assurance of salvation that as they sing this the presence of the Lord will come touch your heart once again set on fire your affection for him For those who are struggling in sin, place your hope in Christ as you sing this song. For those who don't know Christ, turn to him this day. Seek him while he may be found. Let's sing together.